Welcome to another episode of the Good People Effect podcast. Today is a very, very special day because today is my very first video episode on the podcast and I'm super, super pumped to share um, something special with you guys today. So uh, about uh, about three months ago, at the end of last year, uh, my good friends Jay, Jess and Sam, we went on a trip to the mountains uh, in a remote location in Victoria, Australia and we met up with a Buddhist monk at a meditation center um, to talk about life. And from this chat, I'm I'm not joking at all, from this chat we felt, all of us felt so much calmer and more peaceful, but not only that, we felt so much more connected to not only ourselves, but the universe as a whole, from this one discussion, from this hour and a half chat with this Buddhist monk. And I'm really, really excited to share this with you guys, and hopefully, Hopefully this translates um, and you guys get this calming, peaceful, serene, awesome feeling of connectedness uh, within yourselves as well. So this, this is what the Good People Effect's all about. So the show is pretty much about creativity, purpose and adventure and igniting that within people to help you grow as people um, so that you could pretty much um, go out and take, out, take on all the challenges of life Um, in a better way and not everyone has access to the right people right now but that's what the show is about finding those good people to surround you with and giving that to you Uh, so yeah really hope you enjoy the show if you haven't had a chance yet please subscribe to the podcast and subscribe to the channel because there's going to be plenty more good stuff to come Uh, but yeah sit back relax and enjoy another episode of the good people effect podcast I guess I, I should maybe start with saying just thanks for having us here. No, it's it's my pleasure. Yeah. yeah. And even just driving driving up here, I felt calmer every every few meters we we got. Like it just felt like it, it's it's incredible how the fresh air and a nice nice bit of sun and um, just mm. being around nature can make you feel so different. And just and look at the outlook. You know, yeah. it's stunning, isn't it? It feels like we're miles away from anywhere but yeah. actually we're not really not that far at all it's really oh, yes. quite accessible it's pretty cool that you can get get to a spot like this yeah without having to drive for hours and hours and i think we're pretty lucky to have this so close yeah hmm. well okay then so i'll tell you what i do then when i wake up in the morning shall i yeah um so as i was saying earlier you don't want me to say as i was saying earlier do you you can say whatever you like, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, first, my first meditation of the day, I usually do in bed as soon as I wake up. So I'll just immediately wake up and I'll meditate on the unfindability of the self. And the purpose of, of doing that is to set a trajectory for the day because most the the problems of life begin with waking up actually Mm -hmm. so in deep sleep there's no we don't conceive of a self in deep sleep which we call the the clear light of sleep or the clear light of bliss there's no uh, grasping at a self and if and and if we don't grasp at a self there is no self to have any problems and you might notice this that as as you wake up as you ascend the various levels of consciousness, which I al- always talk about in the classes, is as you wake up, the, the first thought you tend to have is me. Mm. Even, if you, even if you travel a lot and sometimes you don't know where you are when you wake up, you know that you're there, even if you don't know where you are. And it's only in dependence upon the thought me that problems come. Like you only remember the difficulties of work once you grasp at a self. You only become frustrated with the idea of getting out of bed once you remember the self. Do you find once you, maybe if you go to sleep in a stressful state, I've noticed that sometimes you wake up and you're, you're less stressful 
than you were when you went to sleep because that sleep has been, I guess, a break from thinking about Absolutely. about me. Yeah, yeah. The the self that was stressed disappears for a while. Mm. You know, and the longer you can be in deep sleep, then the longer there is no experience of self, and so it's it's very. I think the word is cathartic, isn't it? It's very, it's very healing to be in deep sleep. Of course, the idea is we don't need one day we don't need to sleep because mm -hmm. we don't do so much damage to ourselves through the grasping that we normally do. So when you when you say you wake up and you, and you meditate on on that sense of self, I guess, and 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 removing yourself from that, how do you how do you do that? How is that is that a um, is there, a, is there a certain way? Do you, do you focus on that or do you, um, do you not focus on it? Well, I just ask myself a series of questions and then I answer my own questions and I try to, to, to experience the answer to those questions. Like, for example, is, so I sit in a meditation posture, sort of cross-legged and hands in my lap and I, and I ask myself, I ha first of all, I say, oh, here I am, sitting, meditating, and I say, well, what, what is meditating? Is it my body? And I think, well, it looks like my body because of the shape of the thing sitting there. But I always refer to my body as my body. It's my possession. So I always I say, okay, that's not me. That's my possession. That's something that's dying, something that will be buried in the ground. I am bigger than my body, vaster than my body. So maybe, maybe I am my mind. But then I think, well, now I'm calling it my mind. And also it doesn't fit what I relate to as being me because I relate to me being the shape. So then I reach this conclusion, I'm not my body, I'm not my mind. They're two completely different things, completely different. You know, the mind is a vast, formless continuum and the body is this, well, in my case, a short, small, rotting piece of flesh and bone. I think you're being a bit harsh on yourself, <laughs> but I get your point. <laughs> so, but other than, but when I realise oh, I'm not my body, I'm not my mind, I realise, uh, my, my, as I'm meditating, I realise, ah, oh, there is, there's no owner of these things. There's a body here, there's a mind meditating, but there's no owner. And I just sit with that concept, there's no owner, no owner, until everything just becomes calm. Because if there's no owner of the body and mind, if there's no self, then there is no one to be frustrated with the alarm going off. There is no one to be worried about what's coming. And as I say, that, that sets a very good trajectory because then I get out of bed already very peaceful. Mm -hmm. And then I can have breakfast because I need the nutrients rather than because I think I'm going to get happiness from the breakfast. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Most people, they, they think, right, what can make me happy now? I've, I've had to suffer the alarm going off. Yeah. Now I'll have coffee, now I'll have muesli. And as soon as that's finished, then mine goes straight back to now I've got to face work, now I've got to face my colleagues. Yeah. And, and if, you put, look, if you look at that on a, on a lifetime scale, it's a miserable life, you know. Yeah, it's, and it's interesting how people, I guess, they, they chase the sense of happiness and they, they think that they can attain it by either material possessions or like it could be as small as breakfast, but it's yeah. like they, they, they think that I will do this and then I will become happy yeah. as opposed to um, looking within, I guess. And the result of that is that they have a life of aimless wandering because mm. they, that, they get that new sofa or the new uh, IKEA furniture or the new position, the new possessions or the holiday or the new relationship and very quickly there's something wrong with it because they haven't ascertained that there's this unhappy self in the middle of it all mm -hmm. that's just surrounded by scenery and theatre. Yeah. So if we haven't really understood how to be happy then we will keep going to the theatre of life to distract principally, we won't think this, but principally to distract ourselves from the way we feel and try to find some temporary relief. Mm -hmm. But if you look at what that's hap how that's happen happening in the modern world, people are using the devices for distraction. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to just be the furniture and going to, the, going to the beach or going to do things or eating. But nowadays it's also devices. Now, as soon as the mind goes to a, a device, the mind becomes turbulent and it goes into a, a searching process. So people might go on to social media and they're, they're looking for all the pictures and comments on social media and searching 
for for a cul-de-sac actually they're mm -hmm. searching for rest yeah but as we know it's when we when we search for that in social media it's more of an abyss so the mind becomes more restless which makes them more unhappy and because underlying that they're grasping at this true self yeah that true self becomes a miserable true self feels like sometimes it can be a snowball effect so once yes. Um, that's, I guess that comes back to what you were saying about starting your day in a certain way and then kind of um, having that uh, positive, I guess, momentum in the right direction because it can be, it can definitely go that way or it could go the opposite way and it feels like, sometimes it, it feels like things are going wrong and they lead to another thing going wrong and, and then it just kind of gets out of hand but all along, um, I guess the, the underlying thing is, is the mindset and, and where, your, um, where your thoughts are at that are leading, leading that um, that charge of momentum? Yeah, I think it's probably good to um, discuss a little bit what is, what is suffering, mm -hmm. what are problems, mm -hmm. so that you can, we can then piece these two things together and see how people then make their lives worse. Yeah. Um, we, always, we always say in Buddhism that real, a real problem and real suffering is part of the mind that experiences an unpleasant feeling. That's, that's the essence of a problem. Like if whatever problem we have in life, maybe uh, someone says, my boss is a problem. In truth, the, the real problem is the way you feel. It's, it's not the boss. And if it was the boss, then everybody that encountered that person would feel the same. Yeah. So the real, the real problem is the way that we feel. So because we, we mix what we call inner problems with outer problems, we try to solve inner problems by making external changes. So, you know, if we have an unhappy mind, we will turn often to something external to solve that uh, unhappy feeling problem. Mm -hmm. So, the, and as I say, the result of that is, is that we, to a degree, we can distract ourselves. Like if you experience, say, the, the, the pain of, of extreme boredom, if you're sitting at home and you have this restless, bored mind, mm -hmm. Most people will then try to solve that problem by going to the fridge or going to some kind of distraction. And if you go into the fridge and you pull something out, a piece of cake, ah, well, oh, that's better. I can eat this piece of cake to solve this boredom problem. But no problems have been solved. All we've done is buried the problem and have distracted ourselves. So when the cake's finished and maybe we eat too much cake and then we have a problem of nausea, the restlessness actually comes back and it comes back worse than beforehand because we've trained ourselves to remain west restless. Yeah, it seems like that's a continuing theme among well, humans. I mean, from, from the beginning of time, it's just trying to solve problems and creating additional, like you try solving one yeah. and here's another five. So, Absolutely. And it, but it, I feel like there's kind of, it's interesting because that would be, I guess, your common way of thinking. You know, there's a problem here, I'm bored well, then I'm going to go do something and I won't be bored. So, I mean, I guess it's, it's, it's interesting to, um, to look at it from that point of view that it, it is a common way of thinking um, and we kind of need to think in a different way to be able to actually get to the root of the problem. And well, one of the things that, that you asked me was, um, is, how is how is a two and a half thousand year old tradition relevant to the modern world? Yes. And, I would say it's more than relevant, it is essential because it looks like, from my point of view, it looks like the human society is a train wreck about to happen and, and people are, are, are perhaps more desperate, more miserable, more neurotic than ever before in history and there's been so many fabulous inventions and advances in medicine and, and, and so many good things have have been created, but there has not been a corresponding increase in human peace and happiness. In fact, people are much more unhappy now than they've ever been. You know, it's only in this era that we have young children seeing um, psychotherapists and so on. We never even seen that before. So many things, yeah. We, there's there's just so many things that are, I guess, that aren't aren't going great in the world. I'm, I'm thinking the best way to put it, but there's so many also things that are, that are, that are great and, and that have um, better than kind of ever as well. Like a lot more people because of technology, I guess, know about 
different techniques to, to relax. I mean, because the technology, people will be hearing this conversation. So I think yeah. it, it does go both ways. And I feel like um, you're completely right. It does, um, it does put a spin on things where, you know, there's so much more negativity on Earth. Um, and it's brought about this imbalance that is kind of getting worse and worse. But yeah. there are some good things as well, um, I guess. Well, I mean, I think that it goes back to the, the again, the relevance of a two and a half thousand year old tradition. Yeah. You know, as you quite rightly say, we, we, we here at the temple, we use Facebook to advertise our events. Mm. So, you know, it's not like we're blind to where people are looking, mm -hmm. where people are at, but they can either continue to search through social media into the abyss of restlessness, trying to solve their anxiety problems, trying to solve their un unpleasant feeling problems, or perhaps, as you say, they might come across something that's going <laughs> to encourage them maybe to, s just to switch it off for a few minutes and yeah. find a bit of, bit of inner peace. Yeah. So I always think, you know, if, if the real problem is a restless mind, the real problem is unpleasant feelings, and the rest is theatre, and the solution is to train the mind, and Buddhism presents a method for training the mind, then I think, as I said, the, the modern world is actually the perfect um, forum for Buddhist teachings. And sometimes I even wonder if, you know, Buddhism has really been waiting for this time, and this time has been waiting for, for Buddhism, you know, more and more with each passing generation, it seems like the the practice of Buddhism is moving away from the forests and the caves and the mountains and moving into the, the cities and the, the urban areas. And, and like the workplace and the family, it provides the best training ground for training your mind. Like if we can separate, right, I've got the difficult boss on the outside and I've got an unpeaceful, unpleasant, angry mind on the inside, well then my boss is providing me the opportunity to put these ancient teachings into practice. Now you could argue that if you were in a monastery in the forest, you wouldn't get that opportunity to train. You know, you'd have a very regimented lifestyle. But if you were then placed in the middle of a busy city, would you be able to, to still train? So that's why I think it's nowadays... It's perspective, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I think it's perfect. Yeah. I think we say, you know, the world's getting worse, and even I said earlier, the world is like a, a train, looks like a train wreck waiting to happen. But on the flip side, if you've got a spiritual path, it's never been better mm. for, for spiritual development, spiritual training. So you could say, from a spiritual point of view, maybe also we're entering into a golden age of happiness because of the opportunities that we now have to practice. Yeah. So what, when you, when you mentioned the, the structure or the method, um, behind Buddhism, could you give me? I guess, like, I, I know there's, there's probably. Um, I'm not sure if we could squeeze everything in within the time slot we have, but yeah. um, would you be able to maybe touch on that a little bit and and um, maybe give me a bit a bit of a, a brief um, or your version of how you see that 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 method working and okay. how some people might be able to start applying that. Well, so so um, the first teaching that Buddha so Buddha attained enlightenment about two and a half thousand years ago. Okay. And he stayed in deep meditation for a number of days and the, the gods, Brahma and Indra, came to him and said, you need to now reveal what you've realized because people are suffering. So he accepted that request and he gave a teaching in a place called Deer Park, which is uh, near a, a place called Sarnath in India and he gave his very first teaching there. And in his first teaching, which I feel is probably the most relevant to the modern world, okay. it was, you should know suffering. You should, you should know suffering. And, and, he, and it's Im important to realize that what we need to know is not manifest suffering. Like if we're sick, or if we're in pain, or if a partner leaves us, these things are, are manifest suffering. Like recognizing, I guess. Yeah, but, but what we really need to recognize is that our pleasures are suffering. And once we realize our pleasures are suffering, then, I, then we can understand how to be happy, which seems a little bit counterintuitive, but 
I, I talk about this um, process called the pizza process, whereby if it's a Friday night and we're hungry and, we, and we're bored and someone suggests to us, let's get a pizza, your initial thought is, yeah, and you start to feel happy. Mm -hmm. But what you're actually feeling is a combination of excitement and anticipation. And excitement and anticipation are, are the nature of a slightly turbulent mind, which is, which is an aspect of unhappiness, mm -hmm. but with promise. So what we've got is unhappiness with promise, which makes us think it's okay. Then when the pizza arrives, and you open the box, and this, I don't know, it's pepperoni or whatever, and you can smell it, you can see it, that anticipation and excitement is a bit more intense. But what we really want to do is swallow the pizza mm -hmm. so we can really start to enjoy the happiness. And so as you, as you pick up the piece of pizza, pizza, pi, piece of pizza, and it's, <laughs> as you pick up the slice of pizza and it's coming towards you and you can smell it and you can see it and you're salivating and you put it in your mouth, you still, all of that process is still the suffering of anticipation. And some people say to me, no, no, once it's in your mouth, that's where the happiness begins. Mm -hmm. But I disagree because health people say that we're supposed to chew 20 times, don't they, before you swallow. But ha can you actually do that? You know, like most people get about four, four or five, because they want to swallow. But the moment that we swallow, we experience the suffering of loss. So the suffering of anticipation is immediately replaced with the suffering of loss. Now you, you tell me, where's the pleasure? Mm -hmm. So the pleasure is an illusion which we project on that process. A lot of people I, I feel have a, they connect pleasure with happiness. That is, for them, happiness is, is pleasure, I guess. Yeah, but my point is, mm. the pleasure is a trick mm. because there is no pleasure in anywhere in that process. Mm -hmm. Only the promise or the illusion of pleasure. So once you've swallowed, what do you do next? you have another bit because you haven't yet experienced the pleasure. So nobody eats pizza for nutritional value. People eat pizza to be happy. Mm -hmm. So you get through a whole slice of pizza and because you experience the suffering of anticipation and immediately the suffering of loss, you have to have another piece of pizza until you actually can't stomach it anymore because while that process of anticipation, loss, projection and illusion is taking place, our stomach is expanding and you know it's flexible but it does have a point of threshold mm -hmm. and then at the end of it most people will sit there and think well what now mm. they're not content they're not satisfied the pizza has been more like drinking seawater to quench their thirst mm -hmm. because the the illusion of the pleasure which they're hoping will make them happy never came so then they move on to dessert because as we all know there's always room in the dessert stomach so maybe all right I have some ice cream now and it goes on and on it kind of it's a great analogy because it comes back to what we were saying before it, it applies to whole life and it's just yeah it's just a mini version of that I guess and you know how many people are yeah there is not one experience of worldly pleasure and as you say we're just using pizza as an example or, or an analogy mm -hmm. but there's not one experience of worldly pleasure where that doesn't apply and that's why people are wandering aimlessly through life, through their life, basically towards their grave. Mm -hmm. They're always thinking, I'll be happy when. They're always wanting to be happy, but never really finding it. I'm, I'm, I'm currently, like, I, I agree with what you're saying. I've kind of got a bit of a struggle with it, though, because I've, I've found some pleasure in the anticipation. And I've, I've kind of found found like I guess I've become comfortable in that space in certain times so I love I guess I love looking forward to things as a lot of people do but yeah. I, I, I love it so much that I've kind of I guess created um, a lifestyle where I'm, I'm constantly looking forward to things and enjoying enjoying looking forward to things I guess right. um, but I guess I, I might be a bit dependent on it which isn't which is never a good thing well the, the thing is is the thing is, is if, you, if every time you look forward to something, mm -hmm. the thing was taken away from you, mm -hmm. would you still derive the same pleasure? Probably not. If you never, ever, ever got to have the thing you're looking forward to, you just spent your life craving, 
without ever being able to get the thing. Possibly, I, I, like for example, when I, if I was to travel to a new country and I love traveling, the moment I arrive in that country, I know maybe it's a different, different, I guess it's anticipation in some sense, but I know that there's so many amazing things that are about to happen, whether they're positive or negative experiences in my mind, they're still experiences and I'm still gonna grow from them. And I'm, I'm really excited about what's to come. And that, that feeling of anticipation, I really, I guess, um, enjoy that moment and I, I love that moment when that happens um, so it's a little bit different than a pizza but it is similar I yeah. guess um, but again it's the same it's this is it is you, you can still apply the same logic because I'll give you another example which might be a bit closer to to traveling yeah is there was I was once teaching in Sydney and somebody said that they're they they are never more happy when they're playing rugby league which is a very Sydney example because mm -hmm. it's not <laughs> AFL yeah but um, and I said and he said so I disagree I disagree with what you're saying because you know the thought of doing looking forward to it and then playing it which is similar to what you're saying about the thought of going somewhere and what may come and the experiences that will follow and I said well if if it's true if it's a source of happiness then you wouldn't need to not play rugby league. You could keep playing and the experience of pleasure would be increasing. Mm -hmm. But you know. It doesn't work like that. No, because yeah. you get exhausted. Yeah. And also what's gonna happen when he's too old? Mm -hmm. So it's like a very, very slow pizza process mm -hmm. because he's been basing his life on the anticipation, but then all of a sudden he's too old to play. Mm -hmm. So he just sits there miserably watching other people play knowing that where he thought he would find happiness, he can't do anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's the same, you know, whether it's, whether it's travel or and so on. But I wouldn't want to go to the extreme of saying that travel, sport, pizza is inherently bad mm -hmm. or is inherent cause of suffering, because it's not. It's the mind that's relating to it. Like, if you'd already found a contented life, if, if you, you're somebody who naturally has a peaceful mind, or someone who's already got a lot of pleasant feelings coming from within, then you're a happy person going travelling. You're not a, a person trying to take happiness yeah. from the experience. You're not dependent on that and you're that's not chasing the, it. That makes a lot of sense. That's the difference. Yeah. So, you know, I remember um, years ago in Sydney buying a cup of coffee, for example, and thinking that the coffee Actually, it's probably been more times than just in Sydney, but thinking the coffee is a source of happiness. But buying a small coffee because I'm trying to be good. And then getting to the end of the small coffee, sucking the foam out of the cup, wishing I'd paid the extra 50 cents and got the bigger one mm -hmm. because I'm not satisfied. Mm -hmm. There's a huge difference between drinking a cup of coffee because you're trying to get some happiness from the coffee versus being a happy person drinking a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. If you're a happy person drinking a cup of coffee, you can have a small coffee and there's no problem. You don't get a feeling of loss mm -hmm. at the end of the coffee. You don't get a feeling of loss at the end of the game, at the end of the trip or, or so on, or if it didn't meet your expectations. No problem, none of this problem, because mm -hmm. if we're already at peace, well then it's, it's, more like, it's more like sitting on a train with a comfortable chair and watching the, the scenery whiz past. Sometimes it's nice, Sometimes it's not so nice, but because our chair's comfortable, it doesn't really matter. We can enjoy it, whether it's good or bad. You've kind of just explained, I guess, my perception of what meditation is and, and doing the same thing with your thoughts. I guess that's what, the way I look at it. Um, it's just kind of noticing the thoughts that come past without, I guess, focusing on them too much or allowing them to kind of take over. Well, that's a, that's a way into meditation, mm -hmm. but in the end, if we, if we do that, we, we're not training the mind. Okay. We're still letting the mind do as it, as it wants. We're just, we're just less engaging with the thoughts. Okay. What we have to, to do in, um, and I know another question you asked me was, what is mindfulness? Mm -hmm. what, what we really have to do when training the mind is learn which objects of thought or which subjective states of mind function to make us calm and cultivate them. And, th and mindfulness is like a posh way of saying not, not to forget. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, mindfulness holds that. So if in the morning, say for example, we, we meditate on love, 
we, we manifest a subjective mind of love by contemplating kindness of others, for example, you know, like considering all the millions of beings that were involved in the bowl of muesli reaching our breakfast table. And we think, my gosh, I couldn't survive without others. I like to think I could, but everything, my body, my clothing, my food, everything is dependent on others. And maybe we, re we reflect on that and we think, I appreciate others, I need them and then a, a feeling of appreciation or affection comes. The job of mindfulness is not to forget that. So we would meditate on, the, on this affectionate love or appreciation and then we'd hold it and then when we, when we leave and get on the tram or get on the train, we try to hold it with respect to the people we pass. Just think, you know, for example, because you're there, I can have a nice mind towards you or because train drivers driving the train, I'm going to be able to get into the city or wh whatever, you know, but mm -hmm. just trying to see how others are benefiting us. But we can only do that if we're being mindful. And normally we don't, we don't choose what we think. We don't give our mind a job to do. It's normally just a, a tornado of thoughts and feelings related to ourselves. Whereas with mindfulness, we're making a decision. I don't want to think about that. I want to think about this. How do you how do you discover those states that you mentioned earlier that you that that you should cultivate or um, kind of work on focusing on? Well, those states of mind are the Buddhist path to enlightenment. Mm. So you know, we within Buddhism we cultivate uh, several different states of mind which lead us mentally towards increasing happiness, and so. Those states of mind are like, uh, in, the, in the beginning of the path, like a recognition of our mortality, holding in our mind the thought, I'm impermanent, like a, developing a subjective realisation, I may die today. And, I mean, we can just talk about that one for a few moments because that's one of the best. And anyone who comes to the classes know that that's one of my favourite ones because so much happiness comes from that. And what I like, particularly about that is that people think I'm quite pessimistic but it's really the, the polar opposite because say we get out of our bed in the morning and we think I'm not going to die today I've got at least another 30, 40, 50 years or whatever it depends how old you are uh, so I've got years of putting up with my partner <laughs> putting up with my job this alarm going off this miserable life I've got for years and then you kind of, it seems all quite bleak but if we were to think to ourselves but there's no guarantee that I'm not going to die today. You know, I talk about the, in Melbourne City, they do this big, they're doing this big kind of awareness um, campaign on the trams to show that trams are killing people. You know, have you seen it? Like uh, the skateboard with the rhino on it? Yeah, I've seen that, yeah. And, and I, they, won't, they wouldn't spend millions of dollars on that campaign if people weren't being hit by trams. Mm -hmm. But the person that gets hit and killed by a tram didn't wake up that morning and think, I hope today I get hit by a tram. Most people wake up in the morning and think, I won't die today. But in truth, we don't know. And if we, if we think this could be the last day of my life, how do you then relate to your partner or your family or your flatmate? You, you just, you realise that the, the bickering and the disagreements are inconsequential they don't matter mm -hmm. and that love matters and then you say goodbye to your partner and you give him a hug and and you mean it you know like, goodbye I love you and that feeling that you then develop towards your family is, is so beautiful that it kind of allows you to leave with a big smile on your face and that beautiful mind which is a genuine source of happiness came from realizing our mortality mm -hmm. so far from being pessimistic it's the, it's the secret of the meaning of life, how to lead a good life. And it's one of those sayings, I guess, um, people hear a lot, but it's a, bit, it's a bit harder to actually put it into practice, I think. What, I may die today? Yeah, well, like this, like anyone could die at any moment and I really should be doing, you know, making the most out of my life, whatever that means, whether it means um, being more loving or, you know, enjoying every moment of your day as much as you can. 
and but it's it's I guess it seems uh, it's one thing to say or to hear the phrase being thrown around and it's another thing to to practice or, or just experiment with applying it to your life you know why mm. it's because everybody has an intellectual idea of their mortality everybody thinks yeah 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 of course I'm going to die but nobody feels it in their heart mm -hmm. like there is a spiritual journey that has to take place that connects our head to our heart and that journey is meditation. That journey is to sit and, and consider things like um, my body is decaying, my body is on a journey towards powder. Do you think that could bring about sadness as well? Well, it could, it, well, it's a good question. I mean, it makes me delightfully happy but because at the end of the meditation, I feel like I have, I have not a moment to lose, to be a good person. Mm -hmm. So if you were to, I mean, you need to, I guess you need to watch out for that to make sure that you're, you understand that the objective of the meditation is to let go of all the pizzas and find your happiness in, in a good heart. Mm -hmm. And do you know what is a good analogy for this? You know, um, you know the movie A Christmas Carol? I can't say I've seen it. With Scrooge, the movie Scrooge. With, with the, is it like a cartoon? Well, there's several different versions of it made. Um, there is, but it was a book originally by, um, I think Charles Dickens wrote it originally. Okay. But the, the story is that there's this guy, Scrooge, who spends his whole life thinking of himself only. And he becomes bitter and twisted and lonely, and then he gets three visits, the ghosts of Christmas past, the ghosts of Christmas present, and the ghosts of Christmas future. Anyway, by the final visit, he dies. Like in the, in, in the visit, he dies, and he experiences this tremendous suffering. But then he realizes it was a dream. And he wakes up on Christmas morning, realizing I'm still alive. I've still got a chance to be a good person and his entire life transforms and he becomes the kindest, most loving person and his whole life is filled with joy. You hear about those kind of things happening to people that have, I guess, near-death experiences or yeah. get into car accidents and become ha handicapped but somehow become the happiest people walking the planet. Yeah, because they've got perspective, haven't they? Mm. I mean, the things that, 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 that we generally get anxious about are related to thinking I'm a permanent fixture. And we're so not a permanent fixture. Buddha said our life passes like a flash of lightning in the sky or like a, a water droplet falling from a high mountain, mm. which I like because if you think about the journey of the water droplet, it doesn't have any choice but to, to, to hit the end. Mm. It doesn't think I'm just going to hang out on this ledge for a bit. Mm -hmm. Like our life is falling mm. and it has a finite period of time. And even the difference between the size of the droplet and the size of the mountain and the amount of time that you know the planet's been around or yeah. even the amount of time before that. It just doesn't matter. It's all yeah. it's it's not stopping. Yeah. For not even stopping to, to take a break. Mm. Lifespan is constantly running out. Whether we're asleep, whether whether we're awake all the time. So what what do you think I know this I'm just really curious about this and I want to know. Yes. Um, what kind of, what happens when you die according to um, Buddhism? So if we roll back mm. to the beginning of our conversation mm. on what, who we are, mm -hmm. what is a self, mm -hmm. and we realize I'm not my body and I'm not my mind, but other than my body and mind, there's nothing else. We start to question, well, who, who are all these people? Who, who's talking, who's communicating? And we come to this realization that the self exists as a concept or an appearance in the same way that this, your self existed in last night's dream. Like when you were in a dream last night, your body was in bed and your mind projected a new reality. And in that new reality was you, walk, doing your business, walking around, talking to people. We never thought, you know, at that time in the dream world, our body, even though it felt solid, was only an appearance to mind. It was no, there was no solidity to it whatsoever. But whilst we were dreaming, it felt very real. And our mind felt very real. And all the people we met felt very real. But they weren't. And when we wake up, we realize, oh, 
all of those things in that, in that world, in that reality, they've gone. Where did, they, where did they come from? Where did they go to? Well, they come from nowhere, and they went nowhere. They just stopped appearing. So Buddha said that death, the death process, is like the transition of one dream ending and a new dream beginning. So Buddhists, Buddhists believe in past and future lives, and the way, the way they assert that they exist is in the same way that dreams exist. As we die, we leave, this world begins to dissolve in, inward to our heart. The karma is to perceive all of this is then severed, and a new karma ripens, new projection, new dream, new life, new reality. So in, in a way, or in a sense, we're all connected with each other and with everything. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, we definitely have a connection. In fact, one of the um, principal teachings of Buddhism is that all living beings, as I touched on earlier, is the kindness of all living beings because we've all met and we've all been related many, many times over and over again in different ways. Even the fact that we're sitting here now is not by chance, it's because we already have a relationship that we've had probably many times in previous dreamlike lives. Wow, I think you just blew my mind. <laughs> well, it gives, you, it gives you a much wider context for, for experiencing and perceiving and living in reality. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting when you, when you mention kindness that we share to others. And it's, I think it's also interesting what we gain from that kindness. And, and how it's easy for us to look at, uh, look at it in a way of, well, if I'm, if I'm helping this person um, with their problems, then you know, um, you know it's, it's bringing their problems into my heart and that's, weighing, that's gonna weigh me down um, from that kind of an angle. But then uh, it's, it's, it's funny how the opposite usually happens. Well, when I was in Sydney, I, I met a lady, an uh, older lady, and, and she came along to a class, and I'd never seen her before. So I, after the class, I asked her, you know, why had she come? Because, you know, just to have a cup of tea with her and have a chat. And she said, oh, I'm here because my brother has died, and I'm just looking for some techniques for dealing with the grief. And then she said, if you have a few minutes, I'd love to tell you about my brother. So I said, yeah, sure. And she said he was a survivor from a concentration camp in the second, after the Second World War and eventually they moved and settled in, in Australia. But he had what would now be diagnosed as post-traumatic stress disorder, but they didn't diagnose that at the time. Mm -hmm. But he obviously had a, a lot of suffering. And she said one day, a few decades ago, one day he decided, I'm going to love everyone. He just made this decision one day, I'm, I'm going to love everyone regardless, selflessly and unconditionally. I'm going to love the people that kept me captive, the tormentors. I'm going to love the people in the shops, the people in the community. She just said he just decided to love everyone. And so he started um, doing this. Like everybody that he saw, every, everyone's path that he crossed, he just cherished them. And she said as he went through his life, he never expected anything in return, but naturally people started to love him. And she said at Christmas time people would run out of their homes to give him gifts and he became like this incredibly well admired member of the community. But the best part of the story was, the best part of the story was that um, when he died, so she hadn't heard from him for a while, but she had a key to his flat, so she went after she hadn't heard for a while, she went into the, the flat to check on him, went into his room and found his body in bed, dead, but smiling from ear to ear. He had died smiling. And if you consider this concept of transitioning from one dream to another, yeah. he was going somewhere pretty cool. Yeah. And I said, you know, you don't need to grieve, you know, he's, he's very happy. <laughs> you know? yeah. He's got some, he's gone somewhere very, very good. And That's I just incredible. thought that was, again, you know, we always think, oh, people need to return my kindness. People need to return my love. I'm looking for loved ones, but people don't appreciate me enough. But what the benefits of cherishing others far outweigh what a human being could do for us. Yeah, yeah. So just coming back to your journey a little bit, 
where did you where did you find the desire to help others? Well, how did that come about? Because I, were you born with it, or did it was it something that kind of you had to discover? Or I think um, well, I used to have a corporate uh, job, so I used to work in London. What were you doing? Telecommunications yeah. for a big foods worldwide foods manufacturer, mm -hmm. and but I worked really yeah, in, a, in a technical role, and it, after. In 1999, I was paid a big bonus to be on call for New Year's Eve. I don't know if you remember, we thought the clocks were going to stop. Yeah, the big... 1999 and the world was going to end. Millennium thing. The yeah. Millennium Bug, they yeah, called yeah, it. Yeah. So I got paid a huge amount of money to be on call that night. Mm. And the next day, nothing. The world didn't end. Everything continued as usual. And I, I just thought, I'm not sure this is the meaning of life is doing this corporate life, you know, and I just thought, I didn't think it was the meaning of life, so I bought a one-way ticket to Australia with six months in Asia on the way, where I just wanted to investigate or question the meaning of happiness and, and the meaning of life, you know. That was the purpose of the trip? That was the purpose of the trip. Informing that was the thought that maybe sunshine is the source of happiness because mm -hmm. you don't get a lot of sunshine in the UK. So I thought, <laughs> if I go to Australia, I'm bound to be happy because the sun shines in Australia. <laughs> and um, eventually, uh, so I didn't find anything in Asia, although I thought I would. I thought, you know, there's lots of ideas. I tried to speak to the monks in the Buddhist countries, but they didn't really seem that forthcoming. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually I settled in Australia and I, I picked up my career in a merchant bank in Sydney working on the trading floor mm -hmm. um, and again in a technical role and um, that similar feeling arose within you I just thought because you know if you if you work as a, as a in a technical role on a trading floor you get paid quite a lot of money you know keeping the trading floors connecting okay, yeah. to each other so I had pl plenty of money and a nice apartment and a, and a good relationship but this sense of it being just scenery mm -hmm. And this in, inner feeling, this isn't the meaning of life. This, I'm wasting life. Like the scenery is passing, but I'm not finding what the meaning is, you know. And at times I think it can be quite, just quite depressing if you really feel this isn't it. Mm. And, you, and you don't know what else to do. You don't know what is it. And, and you don't know what is it, and exactly. You're, and you're, yeah, for sure. I mean, I've definitely felt that before. I, I remember my friends, because I, you know, I live with some friends in the UK, and I'm trying to have this discussion with them, you know, and they said, you've got one of the best jobs of all of us. Mm. You've got the best income. You shouldn't be having these thoughts. Mm. So then on top of these thoughts, I've also felt a bit guilty. A bit of pressure on <laughs> yeah, in different know? directions, yeah. You can't have a better life, you know, how dare you? Feel yeah. that there's something missing. Yeah, and then I guess if you compare your life um, in that corporate world that didn't feel quite right to someone that, you know, has no access to money or even clean water or something, then it, it does exactly it does add another element to it, doesn't it? Yeah, so you end up thinking, I should be, I should feel this is it. Yeah, so I guess maybe a bit of, yeah, so you said guilt seeps into it, which is, exactly. isn't a good thing either. So in the end, um, um, I thought, I know, I've tried travelling, mm. I did enjoy travelling like you do, and I've tried, but in the end nothing, it, mm. it's, like a, it's like mist that evaporates, so you don't, there's no essence to it, you know, you can't hold any of it. You're left with, I guess, memories. You're left with memories, but you can't, they, they're not powerful enough to change you as a person. Mm -hmm. They, for me, maybe unlike you, for me they just made me want to go and do it again. I feel, I feel like travelling does change you as a person, I feel like you, you, you grow and develop um, in a certain trajectory that you probably wouldn't normally... If you stayed in your familiar surroundings. Yeah, if you if everything was the same every day and you, you stuck to that corporate routine, for example. Yeah. I think if you explored the world, you would grow in a different way. But I get what you mean is uh, you wouldn't, like when you're, when you wouldn't fill you up inside. I guess if that's all you did, that would be a point where you've had too much pizza. Yeah, yeah basically. Yeah. But I mean, you're right. I mean, also, just to sidestep a second, you're right, I think the travelling did provide the necessary stepping stone mm. for me then to look at spiritual development because I'm, you know, I was a down the pub 
drinking beer, playing pool kind of person. Oh, really? Outside of my career, yeah. yeah. And going to dance parties, and you know, that was really my life. It was very mm -hmm. kind of a mainstream mm -hmm. kind of 20 something yeah. life, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, and I needed to break out of that to perhaps see, see there are other options. Mm -hmm. But the principal driver was this feeling that it's all, it's all scenery that's past and I'm still, that's past, I'm now doing this again. Where does it end? You know, mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the goal? What's the, where's the place of rest? So how did you get from, from that point to where we are here, sitting under this beautiful well, tree? A Buddhist center opened up in the next suburb mm -hmm. to where I was living and, and, I, and it made me think, well, look, I've tried, so I've tried traveling, I've tried career, relationship, everything, and, I'm, and I get this feeling, but I've never tried meditating. And so I, I popped around to the, the new Buddhist center, which was um, the temple in Sydney, where I, where I originally came from, and I picked up a flyer for their courses. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to try this. And I went to a day course, and I thought, that's it. Like, that's the problem. And the day course was, it was all about what I described earlier as the pizza process. It was called Constant Craving. That, remember, the title of the course was called Constant Craving. And it was about constantly trying to get happiness from external things and then being left with a sense of dissatisfaction and how satisfaction comes from inside and then you can enjoy the things. It's got to be that way around. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is, this is lining up with all the thoughts I've, I've been having. And so it wasn't like a revelation. It wasn't like the, the clouds parted and then these shards of light came down. I just thought, I'm gonna keep doing this because I can follow this logic and solve these, these problems, this feeling that I've been having. Mm -hmm. So I just kept doing it. And, and um, I remember in particular, my boss in the bank was very, very difficult. And I went to the teacher, one of the teachers in the temple, and I said, look, I've got this, I've been going for a few months. I was feeling a lot happier, but I still had this difficult boss. So I said to the teacher, I've got this difficult boss. What shall I do about it? Expecting him to say, you need to be patient. But he didn't. He said, you have to love him. And I said, whoa, you know, hold on a minute. You don't know this person. And he said, well, you don't have to love him. It's a free world. He said, but if you don't love him, you will never solve this problem. So I said, all right, I'm prepared to take on a, a Buddhist project. Bit of a mission. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, these guys already know this story, <laughs> as long as most of these stories. But um, um, I, I found it incredibly difficult because I had already too much invested in seeing him as the cause of my problems. Mm -hmm. But over a period of about six weeks, I tried lots of different tricks on my own mind. And one of the things I tried was to superimpose my brother's face on him. <laughs> because I, with my mind, not actually, I didn't go up to him and stick a piece of paper on his face. <laughs> But I already love my brother, so I, I thought, well, okay, let's give this, a, give this a while. And for as long as I could hold it, I started to see my brother could behave, my brother could get away with this behaviour. So why would I not let my boss get away with this behaviour? And then I started to, to, to have a different view of him. And in the end, after about six weeks, we actually became friends. And he started telling me jokes. And for most people, that's not a big deal, but if you knew him, you would think that was a big deal, that he was saying, telling jokes. And I'd be working at my desk, and then I'd hear his chair come rolling up next to me, and he'd tell me a joke. And then he'd roll off again. And I thought, wow, everything's changing. And then he started telling me about difficulties with his family, and, and, and we, we became friends. So you yourself was the one that, that changed, really? Well, that's the key. Yeah, it's interesting. Because I went back to the teacher and said, thanks for your advice, mm -hmm. I'd put it into practice and my boss changed. And the teacher said, no, he didn't. And I thought, I thought, wow. Mm. I thought, you know that scene in The Matrix 
where I'm um, liking these movie references. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where Morpheus says, if you take, I can't remember the colours now. But red and blue, I think, yeah. The red pill, you go back to basically your ordinary life and you'll forget yeah. all of this. And if you take the blue pill, you see how far the rabbit hole goes. Mm. For me, that was that moment where I thought, if I can change my reality that much with such little effort, with a relatively small situation, I want to see how far my mind can be developed because yeah. my whole reality is dependent on the way I think. So you saw the potential of just, just through that one little action. Yeah. And then I, I saw a, a, a play of the life story of Buddha, which just made me cry. Mm. I saw this, this, you know, this man who just wanted people to be happy and showed them how their own mind was making them miserable and led them very skillfully into everlasting happiness. And I just thought, I want to follow his footsteps. Yeah. Those, so those two things were the key, the key kind of game changers for me. And then I, I requested to become a monk. Mm. And that was in, I requested to become a monk at the end of 2003. Yeah. And I became a monk in May 2004. Mm -hmm. And since then, the way you feel now, how do you, how do you feel? I feel pretty good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I have a very, I have a very simple, disciplined life yeah. in which I know every moment what I'm doing. And I think that alone is valuable, but the fact that I, my whole life is a path to everlasting happiness, not just for me, but for everybody, mm -hmm. because that's the goal is to take everybody to everlasting happiness. It fills me with joy mm -hmm. having such meaning in my life. You know, I suppose if you were to plot it on a graph, you have better days than others, but definitely it, the net result is, is that every passing year, I'm, I feel I'm getting closer to my goal. I guess I, I kind of wanted to know um, what it was, would be like to be constantly peaceful. I'm not sure if you are, that was just an assumption, but Working on it. yeah. I mean, the, I, is, it, is it dull in any way? Is it kind of, do you take away the highs and lows of life and take away, I guess, the spice of life and... Um, yeah, a lot of people say, there's a lot of sayings in the world, which is um, things like, um, you gotta have the lows to appreciate the highs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Variety is the spice of life and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. But, you know, the, the lows and the highs are, are, the are in the same continuum. You know, like, if you like a high, as we talked about earlier, the high is like an excitement of something that's coming. And often it doesn't come, and then, and then a low comes instead. So rather than have this roller coaster of emotions, in, in Buddhism we say, let's just, let's get off the roller coaster and just have a constant gold-like inner peace. Mm -hmm. You know, like, not a, a dull lead-like mind mm -hmm. or a sparkly diamonds-like mind, a gold-like constant inner peace. And, you know, this saying, the variety is the spice of life, I feel like it's a cop-out. I feel like that's what people are saying because nothing's working. Mm -hmm. So they have to keep trying lots of different things to keep distracting themselves. Mm -hmm. Whereas there is another way which we've touched on, which is if you be peaceful, if you've got a peaceful mind, we say that we define happiness as the experience of pleasant feelings arising from inner peace. If you've got a peaceful mind, if you've got happiness, it doesn't mean you, you, you have to give up all of those things, but we have to give up the view that those things are gonna make us happy in order for those things to, for us to derive happiness from those things. Mm -hmm. Once, as I said, once we've already got inner peace, have so much fun. And it, and, the, and it gets even better because if those things come to an end, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter either way because, yeah, if you spill that coffee, you're still a happy person. You're still on the train watching yeah. the passing scenery and something else will unfold. It's all a, a dance of changing appearances and conditions and yeah. Just enjoy the next, the next yeah. act. Yeah. Yeah. So would you be able to just walk me through, I guess, um, kind of your day, your, your typical day. So you, you get up in the morning, like we were saying before, and you, is there other, other monks here? Do you kind of have, what kind of conversations do you guys have? Do you, do you kind of, do you just hang out for the day? Do you do teachings? Like, 
what do you kind of do? Yeah, I think people kind of had this view that we just sit around, incense burning. Yeah. Um, incense is actually banned here. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a, it's a, an allergen mm -hmm. and a fire hazard. Mm -hmm. So we don't actually burn any so incense. no incense. No incense. <laughs> I've got one of those oil burners though. Mm -hmm. So I do my morning meditation and then I change all my offerings on my, on my shrine. And then, I, and then I start work, which means to check all of my emails, meeting with the education team in the office. So we've got a team of people here that do our marketing and they're also Buddhist practitioners. Mm -hmm. One of them is a Buddhist nun. The other one uh, who you met earlier, Jake, he's, uh, he's one of our teachers and also our program coordinator. So the three of us work together and we, we think about the delivery of, of the courses and okay. so on. Yep. So, so there's a lot of work involved actually yep. and we, don't, we haven't escaped the modern world, we're very much in the modern world but we're trying to apply our meditation and practice. in a way. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, we have a community lunch mm -hmm. and then I'll spend a long time doing my own study. I'm under a process of constant um, study and assessment so I, I will get tested many times a year by the organisation to make sure that I'm um, memorizing scriptures and my understanding is increasing, which is good for this place. That's interesting. So you're, you're ever kind of growing yeah. your understanding. So it's not something you can, I guess, learn overnight. It's something that you, it takes time to, or I guess it sounds like years to really, yes. to understand. Yeah, the, the teacher training program that we run here is a 15 year program. And I'm on a, on a program that will probably last for the rest of my life mm -hmm. and um, and that, that's good for the students because then they can have confidence that that I'm you know I, I'm accountable like I have to be always studying always meditating always mm -hmm. memorizing my teachings always need to be improving and the organization will be checking on that as well it's my commitment as a resident teacher so I spend a lot of time studying and a lot of time preparing teaching so my day is made up of meditating prayers, working and study and preparation for the next teaching. Mm. So it's very full actually, yeah. very full. I mean, um, actually becoming peaceful has been one of the busiest things I've ever done <laughs> in my life. That's interesting. But again, fills me with joy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Um, I've got, I've, I did, I'm just going to throw this question in here just because I've got a, um, a friend that's, that's struggling struggling with this and I was hoping um, actually a couple of friends have been um, have mentioned a similar kind of uh, experience when when you meditate I know it's I sound a bit random in regards to what we were just talking about but when you meditate a lot of people struggle with not thinking or, or, or thinking they need to not think or just yeah. um, getting into getting into it really yeah. have you got any I guess actionable tips or um, any kind of um, any suggestions for people that might have might kind of come across this pro problem? Because I'm sure maybe your students yeah. would come well, across similar ones in the beginning. The first thing I would say is that the the idea of of meditation being about not thinking mm. is a misconception. Mm -hmm. Yep. And there are there are a lot of people that believe that meditation is about letting the mind go blank, mm -hmm. but it's actually very it's, it's not the best way to practice because if we let the mind go blank our mindfulness declines the, the strength of our mindfulness declines because mindfulness and meditation is like a muscle you're, you're working at you're increasing the strength mm -hmm. of your ability to hold mm -hmm. and if you if you're letting the mind go blank your the strength of your mind and your ability to hold on to an object is degenerating and in the end you will you will lose the ability to remember stuff. Even if you can do it, it may feel peaceful and relaxing to start with, but the, ultimately it's going to cause a lot of problems with your mind. And um, in our book, How to Understand the Mind, it's, it's even printed, the ultimate result of just allowing the mind to go blank is we become dull and stupid. So meditation is not about letting the mind go blank. It's about, it's about ascertaining something to hold and then holding it with all your heart you know for as long as we can hold a single object of meditation it will work to make us peaceful 
Okay, so the question was to give an example of this object. Yes. Okay, so an introductory meditation, which we can do in, in a couple of minutes, mm -hmm. is, um, is to meditate on the breath. So what we do is we, we first of all allow our breathing to take a steady rhythm. And a rule of thumb in getting the breathing right is to ensure that you breathe through the nostrils and that you're not making any sound and there's no haste. Do you use your diaphragm at all? Um, do you use a diaphragm at all? We need to have a straight back, but that's not essential okay. to use your diaphragm. Okay. The most important thing is through the nostrils and breathing very gently. Mm. And that's why I say as a rule of thumb, no, no sound. Because sometimes if it, your nostrils are making sound, not very good if you've got some, if you're a bit congested, but in general, no sound and no haste. So you breathe very gently, very lightly. And then the breath becomes the object. So that we focus the mind on the subtle sensation of the breath just inside the nostrils. So as, normally as you inhale, there's, a, there's quite a cool sensation. And then when we exhale, there's a warmer and softer sensation. So there's like a cool as we inhale and then a warmer, softer sensation as we exhale. And then we, we, we place the mind on that sensation. So that that sensation fills the whole space of our mind. It is just cool, warm, cool, warm, nothing else. And we hold it rigidly, you know, we don't, we don't let go of that object. If the mind does become distracted, without any discussion, we go straight back. So this will happen, you know, when you first start meditating, it will seem like the mind is busier than it normally is, but it's not. It's just because we've become, become more inwardly focused. And so we're seeing more what our mind does to us 24-7. Uh, the analogy that I use is, is if you want to go swimming in the ocean, you have to kind of get through the breaking surf before you can start swimming up and down the beach. And as you do that, the surf knocks you over and you've got to get back up again, you've got to duck under a couple of waves, but eventually you get through it and then it's calm. So the same would be the case now when we do this meditation, is it might seem a bit busier, um, there might be a bit of turbulence, you might lose the, the breath, you might get distracted, it's okay. But as soon as we realize we've dropped the object, the breath, as soon as we realize we're distracted, just come straight back. Mm -hmm. We might have to do that a number of times and eventually the mind will settle, we hold the breath and we'll start deriving pleasant feelings. So there's a bit of persistence, so we need to not give up at those early stages and kind of push through. Um, knowing that we will eventually reach. Exactly. That point. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then once we've, through a bit of persistence, once we do get through, it says in, the, in Buddhist scriptures that just from this meditation alone, just meditating on the breath, a deep happiness and contentment naturally arises. And with that, we can start solving some problems with life and we can start enjoying the coffee. <laughs> but we want to do it with a subjectively contented, peaceful mind. Okay. So should we? I think we do that? I think it's yeah. It'd be it'd be nice so that people listening can kind of follow along and and meditate with us. And if no one's tried it or some people haven't tried it before, they can give it a go for the first time. But okay, yes. about five minutes. Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. So I don't just, know. That sounds good. Can I borrow your watch? Just so that I know. <laughs> Thanks very much. So you're you're going to lead us. So I'll guide the meditation yeah. for about about five minutes, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, thanks very much. Okay. So if we find a comfortable posture, which basically means straight back, hands in your lap. If you like, then the traditional Buddhist meditation posture, which is your right hand on your left hand with your thumbs lightly touching, or any comfortable p posture is okay. Lower your eyelids, drop your shoulders, bow your head slightly, place your tongue behind your upper teeth, unclench your jaw, and we can begin by remembering that the objective 
is to find a deep happiness and contentment for the purpose of solving some problems, emotional problems, and finding some happiness from the things in our life. So then we set the breathing by breathing gently through our nostrils, ensuring no sound and no haste. So just breathing gently and naturally. There's no need to force the breathing, try to control it in any way, just breathe normally, naturally and gently. You may notice that as you gently inhale, the air feels cool. just inside your nostrils. And as you exhale, the air feels warmer, softer. Focus your mind on this sensation, single-pointedly. Remain focused for the next few minutes. Remember, if you become distracted, drop the distracting thought and return to the sensation of the breath.
Okay. And when you feel ready, in your own time, you can gently relax your concentration and arise from the meditation. It's only short, but if you do that um, for 10 or 15 minutes every day, mm -hmm. it'll completely change, change your life. Yeah. And that's only an introductory meditation. We touched on death, we touched on love, we touched on compassion, we touched on wisdom, but there are so many meditations that we can do that will form yeah. a spiritual journey yeah. to a complete transformation. Thank you. No Thank, Thank you, you so much. I've, I really enjoyed this chat. Yeah, any time, Michael, it was great. It was, it was great meeting you and just being here, it just feels, just coming out of that now, I just, I'm not sure how you guys feel, but I feel pretty good. It's a, it's a blessed place as well. It's a blessed place. And if we're peaceful, I think we're, our minds are aligning with how blessed it already is here. Yeah. Like there's, there's no gap, but normally we come still a little bit disturbed and tense and full of the world. Yeah. But as we become more peaceful, we become a little bit more in line with how blessed. And kind of connect with the surroundings and it's yeah. nice, yeah. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Good People Effect podcast. I really hope you got something out of this show. This show is just, it's here for you. It's all about you and helping you grow as a person. And I really hope that you got something out of this chat um, and you enjoyed it. So if you want to see more content um, like this, then please subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the podcast because I'll be releasing a new episode on adventure, creativity, and purpose every single two weeks. Every single two weeks? Every two weeks. Um, but yeah, if you want some more information about the Kadampa Meditation Center in the Dandenongs or about the Buddhist monk that I spoke to, Kel San Don Ying, please visit goodpeopleeffect.com and check out the show notes. Uh, but until next time, be well. <laughs>